So we're in Acts chapter 12. Miss Rosie says verse 20. Is that where we are? Hit that doorbell soon, somebody. Hit that doorbell for me. Somebody's coming to the Lord's house. Every time you hear the doorbell ring, somebody's coming to the house of the Lord. Right, coming to the house. I'm, I'm probably one of the only people to leave my front door open. But my front door is typically open. <laughs> she could just walk right in my house. Oh, my bad. <laughs> well, I'll lock it now. <laughs> I'm going to Chapter 11, they have preached Gentiles, they received the, the, the gospel, uh, they showed the sign that the Holy Spirit was with them. I was talking to the Lord this morning about, uh, matter of fact, about uh, cessation of gifts, uh, that the gifts have ceased. Um, and uh, I'm not a cessationist. A cessationist believes that the gifts have ceased. I don't believe the gifts have ceased, have ceased um, because I believe in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, and that which is perfect has come. And that which is in part will be done away. I think that which is perfect is Jesus. I think when Jesus comes back, all the gifts will cease. Um, but I'm not one of those people that believe that the sign gifts are normative. Like people just walking around raising the dead, speaking in tongues. We don't, we don't, I don't believe that happens all the time. But it could happen in some remote part of the world. It could happen in some remote part of D.C. I don't know what it could happen where God is doing something to get glory. So I do believe that. Um, so when the Gentiles received the gospel, they rejoiced, it said. And, and, and I was thinking today just about, it's just as miraculous today for someone to forgive. Someone to be kind, someone, someone to be understanding and loving, and it's the fruit of the spirit. It's just as supernatural. And I was talking to God that, that people don't think it's supernatural. So I was thinking about our brothers and sisters who go to a charismatic church, and I was thinking like what people are looking for is the supernatural. They're looking for the supernatural. They're looking for it. And I'm like, but it is just as supernatural to live holy. It is just as supernatural to live a pure life. It is just as supernatural as somebody speaking in tongues. It's, it's just as supernatural. But we don't see it that way. I don't think we see it that way. But it takes God to live a pure, holy, blameless life. It takes the power of the Spirit of God in us to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. So if you're doing those things, that's a spiritual, supernatural, awesome thing of God. But I think sometimes we think we can do it. I think sometimes we're trying to do it. And I think we're trying to live a certain way versus, versus just submitting to the Holy Spirit and letting him live his life through us because that looks different from the way we live. And then the other thing I was thinking about, a lot of times we were in sin and we don't know it by complaining, by um, talking about people, uh, you know, just different ways we're in sin. I mean, we're in gross sin and we don't know it. We don't know it, but the Holy Spirit will let you know. The Holy Spirit will say that ain't right, or that person not there to defend themselves, or how's this helping, or, you know what I'm saying, the Holy Spirit, how's that loving? The Holy Spirit will ask them questions, but I'm like, wow, Lord, you know, we are, um, what'd you say? So a lot of times when people are doing that, they're in sin because they're not considering the person. So that conversation, the way that conversation is to happen 
is the person that has been offended um, needs to allow another person to speak into their life. And sometimes you don't know when somebody's been offended. And you don't mean to offend someone, but you've offended them, but you don't know it. And so then you go to try to talk to somebody that you've offended that you don't know. You might be saying what's right, but they're not listening to you because you've offended them. So what the Holy Spirit is telling us is you offended them, right? The Holy Spirit is trying to tell us that they're not listening to you because they're offended. So now you got to figure out, okay, it's never my desire to offend you, so let's start over. I like what the women did Tuesday night. Let's just start over. Let every relationship start over and begin from square one. Because often people are, are doing things that they don't, and then people are not always honest. And so if people are not honest and you walk on something that when people are not honest, I found out so many things where people, people tell me, yeah, tell me the truth. I want to know the truth. People don't want to know the truth. Yeah, they don't. They don't. They don't. Yeah, yeah. But, but people don't, they're not ready for the truth because most people think they know what the truth is. And then when they find out that you know the truth, then all of a sudden everything changes. You know, you, you'll be talking to somebody and they say, well, I talked to so-and-so, and you can just see their face because they don't know that you know so-and-so. So I talked to and then the whole face just dropped because now what they're saying, they said, but you started this conversation, I would tell them the truth. And I'm like, I just happen to know the truth already, so I'm coming to let you know I know. And you just see, so, so then I'm learning that, well, you really didn't want to know the truth, but you wanted me to know your truth, not the truth. And that helps me love people because I'm like, everybody has, there's the truth, and then unfortunately, there's our truth. And if that, those two truths don't match, it's usually uncomfortable. Okay? <laughs> so I'm just, just trying to help. God is, the Spirit of God is trying to help all of us out today. Right? When those two truths don't match, it's, it's uncomfortable. Because we've created some storyline that often, it, you know, um, I was listening to my youngest brother preach the other day, and he said something in the sermon. Now, he said something in the sermon that to him is true, but to me, I view it differently. I view it differently. Um, you know, and there's a truth, but there's a way we perceive the truth. There's a way we perceive the truth, and it, it has to do with the way we grow up. We both grew up in the same place. I view it one way. He views it a different way. There's five of us as children. All five of us. And you got, Miss Rosie just said, how many did you say? Twelve. So that family, twelve people, got twelve different perspectives of daddy, mommy, how we were raised, where we were from. You know, and you got to keep, you got to take all that into account when we go and reach our family. Because the same house we grew up in that, that we might think was the best place on earth, somebody else might think is hell. So if you got them two range of, and then you come and y'all gonna disagree, and we're not even disagreeing about the, the right thing. We just don't love each other to know each other enough to know why things happen a certain way. Okay. So what I, I said, all of that to say, it is supernatural for us to rely on the Holy Spirit to confront, to have relationships, to love, to not judge. It takes the Holy Spirit in us to do it right. Okay? And we want to do it right. We want to walk by the Spirit, and we want to do it right. And all I'm saying is that takes a moment by moment, day by day, intentional focus on God. Intentional. Got to be intentional. Okay? Uh, I was just thinking, I asked somebody the other day, I asked somebody a question the other day. They said, why'd you say that? And the way the person thought about it, they thought about it like, did I question how they felt? And I was like, no, I didn't mean anything by it. But I was so glad that we were in a relationship that person could tell me how they were feeling when I said something. So I'm just saying, I'm learning how to walk in the spirit. Because if you try to learn people, it's 15 people in here at least, right? That's, if I had to learn all of you and learn to speak to all of you a different way, I mean, come on, I'd go crazy. But if I just let the Holy Spirit speak when I speak, it's always going to be a blessing. So I'm encouraging all of us to do that, all right? And believe it or not, that has a lot to do with what happened in chapter 12.
Oh, really? In the family? Within the family? Yeah. 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 So you got, you got you, right? Okay. <laughs> you got, I know you got your whole witnesses. Witness, everything, everything. So many. now, but one of them was a Catholic woman. But I said, which one knew God? And he looked at me, and he said, I don't know. <laughs> so I said, well, we want to know God. It doesn't, that doesn't matter where, you, where you're from. Like, which one actually knew him? And so I shared the gospel with him that day. But uh, no, he said nobody had ever told him that. I was like, yeah, I just want to know which one knows God. I don't care about where they're at. I want to know which one can, can get, to the, get to the Lord. Okay. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Listening to you, you know, talk about the truth and everything. You know, when, it, when you speak like that, you know, I have bones in the, in the Bible, in my thought pattern, right? So I was just thinking about when Jesus was talking to, uh, I think, the pilot. Mm -hmm. And he yeah. said something about what truth is. He said, what is truth? I would say, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then from there, when you were always talking, I went to John, I think it's 16 or 17. When did he say that, well, you know, I got to go. If I don't go, he won't come. And then I started thinking about what he said after that. He said, when, I, when he does come, he would tell you all things. But then, you know, I said to myself, what well, he was talking about, the spirit of the truth. Yeah. When he was talking about walking in the spirit. Yeah. You know, then, you know he, he, he'll tell you. You know, because he is the truth. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's good. That's good. And John 17 <laughs> says, Sanctify the light of truth. Your word is true. Did he help? Yeah. Because if I, I'm, I'm coming to you, if I know something wrong, I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> and I hope I have a friend that when I'm out of step, help me to get back in the step because I don't realize it. And you see in me, that is all of us have blind spots. And I'm looking for you to help nurture me that I might elevate it above that. That's, that's what we want to do. That's, that's my, uh, when I get to my children, you might not receive it, but I did what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to tell you the truth. You say, well, so, so, we've been talking about so, 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 and that's about, uh, that sounds good, like, but the word of God says such and such a thing. I'm going to tell you about the word of God, so whether you receive it or not, that's your responsibility. It is a responsibility, but if they don't receive it, then, we, then, then really we haven't told them the truth. Because they didn't receive it. I told them the truth according to the word of God, but they didn't want to hear it. Yeah. I mean, it's two, it, what you're saying is two, there's two levels to it. There's one level where, where like, I heard you and I see it. I'm not going to face it. Now, that's, that's the right way. But then there's another way that says, I can't hear what you're saying because you are in the way. Not you, but the person. I'm in the way. And because I'm saying it. And that still could be the other person's fault, meaning they could be believing something that's not true. But what I've learned is, but if they're not getting the truth, then I got to get it. I got to tell somebody who can reach them. Like, I can't say, well, I did my part. I got to say, okay, they're not listening to me. So who will they listen to? Then I need to find somebody that they'll listen to so that they can reach them with that truth. And that's like when all of us who have children, you know, when you're raising your children, you get to a place where they're not listening to the parent. But the parent can always find somebody that they listen to. So sometimes you got to go to that person and say, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, hey, could you pour this into my son's ear because he listens to you? And then they'll, they'll receive it that way. I'm just saying when you love and if you if the Holy Spirit lets you know they didn't receive it that we're not off the hook that's what I'm saying I'm saying so now find find a way that they can receive it because a lot of times the reason they don't receive it is because of the relationship like a relationship might be bad so they won't receive it there but they may receive it from someone else or they may receive it they may receive it from you in a letter versus me talking to you 
You know, it just, it's just the Holy Spirit is saying love. Love says sacrifice. Love says do more. Love says don't ever think, all right, I, love says I've done all I can do. That's what love says. Love doesn't say, I told you, and I'm, it, I'm done, you know. Love says, okay, if you didn't, I don't think you heard what I, I don't think you're listening to me. Because then if you, if you have a conversation with those people, sometimes they'll tell you, yeah, I'm not listening to a word you say because of X, Y, Z. Then you know how much they haven't heard <laughs> if they actually tell you that. And sometimes people will when you have a conversation with them. And then sometimes they'll tell you why they're not listening. So if you get that far in the conversation, then, then if that's me in a conversation, I'm like, well, I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry. Because whatever that thing is that made it like that, that's my fault. I take responsibility for that. So now let's start over. And I think, I think then people can hear because they know that you don't mean to hurt them. Like, it, I didn't mean to hurt you. Like, I mean to, you know, it, it, what I'm talking about a lot is in, in family relationship with children and parents. You know, sometimes that relationship, because you're growing up as a parent, that kid is growing up, that child's growing up, and you're raising them. So a lot of times we are just giving them commands, right, versus they grow to a place where the relationship changes, where there needs to be an exchange of ideas. Even though you're still the parent, there still needs to be a now that needs, because they're grown, they're growing, they're grown, some of them. And so now they need to exchange ideas. And if you're still trying to bark orders at them, they just stop listening because they like, I'm an adult. I can make my own decisions. And, you know. Like we talk and roll and I talk. I'm not talking about with the children because I know that you have children when they're small. And this when you get big, they choose their own direction. My duty is to pray for them to just who they are. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, all people, what all people need that care. That's what I'm saying. All people need that care. And she thinks she's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's great if that relationship is it it lends itself to that. I said a friend, a friend, someone that loved. I'm not talking about feeling love. Cares for you. When you're up, they love you. When you're down, they love you. I can sit down and talk to him for love. Let's say, that's not right. He's lying to him. I said, but why you say that? Show me why I said, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I need to ask forgiveness. You know, after the study, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. Yeah, I want to talk to you. All right, so, so let's, let's, uh, let me tell you then what happened in chapter 12, right? So, so in chapter, oh, go ahead, Miss Hill. Oh, you want to know what happened in chapter Yes, ma'am. Well, Eric killed Jack. Okay, Herod kills James. Who is Herod? James. James is king. Herod Agrippa? Herod, I mean, Herod Agrippa, right. Herod Agrippa the first. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah, keep going, Miss Hill. Peter You're doing was, well. Peter was in prison. Peter became in prison because Herod enjoyed what he was doing to the church because he was getting famous that way. <laughs> so he wanted to keep going. What stopped him from killing Peter? Passover. The time is the Passover, so he says, uh, we'll wait. So he puts him in prison. Please continue, Ms. Hill. Harry Agrippa had the apostle James, John's brother, killed, and he put Peter in prison at the church. Prayed for Peter. Uh, the angel released Peter from prison. He went to John Mark. searches for Peter, can't find him. So then what? What does Herod do? He sent guards. Yes. All right, he had, and then what did he, have, what did he do to the guards? 
They killed the guards, and we talked about that. We talked about the, the killing of those guards. We're back to the crucifixion of Jesus. We talked about the guards that guarded the tomb, and we talked about how this is great evidence um, here that that's what should have happened to the guards that were guarding Jesus because they lost the body, yet the guards that were guarding Jesus, yeah, they told a lie. What happened to them? They got rich. They were paid. They were paid to spread a lie, right? But you know what happened, because they're showing you, and this is what happens when you lose a prisoner. You die, and they killed them. They killed them, right? Okay, so that brings us to where we are in verse number 20. To the end of this chapter, we're going to finish this chapter and go into about 12 verses of chapter 13, Lord willing. So verse number 20 says, Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastus, who is Blastus? Blastus is the king's personal aide, probably the treasurer of the king. That's who Blastus is. But the, the people of Tyre and Sidon made him their personal aide, I mean, made, made him their friend, like Miss King just said, a friend. So they made friends with him, and they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So they came, they made friends with Blastus, who is the aid treasurer of the king, and so now what they're doing is trying to make peace because the king is supplying them with food, okay? Verse number 21, so on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to the people, I'm sorry, gave an oration to them, and the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. So you understand what's happening? So then Herod comes, and Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, says that this robe could have been made with silver. So it's shining, it, it's, a, it's a royal robe. Usually royal robe is in purple, but this is, a, this is a, a beautiful robe, and people are watching him speak in his robe, and the people start shouting, this is the voice of a god, not a man. So what happens in verse 23? Okay, so hold, so hold it. So immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, smote him, struck him. Why? Because he took the glory. Because he took glory that belonged to who? So when Jesus was speaking, it wasn't, well, he is God, right? But anybody that's speaking and the people look to him like he's a God, in this situation, God immediately struck him. Because, like Ms. King said, he did not give glory to God. He should have been saying, like Peter, remember when Peter and James in chapter 3, they said, why are you looking at us like we did something we didn't? It's in the name of Jesus that this man is healed. Now think about you when you look at television. And think about when you look at the people on television that want you to send them money. Who are they giving the glory to? So how many of you guys know Miles Monroe? Heard of Miles Monroe? Okay. I really believe with all my heart that something like this happened to him. He died in a plane crash. Yeah, he died in a plane crash, but before that, he did a message, and I listened to it. He did a message, and he was tell, saying that when you, you don't have to give people the gospel and talk about the cross. He says, people don't want to hear nothing about no blood, and it's packed, and people are taking notes. Two weeks later, he died in a plane crash, and I believe because he did not give glory to God, because he is taking away from the message, I believe that God, I believe that God allowed him to be taken out. I really did. So you can do your research on that, look at that, look that up. But, and that happened, I don't know how many years ago now, if you look at his death, but it's in the last two or three years. Two years ago? 
Yes, in the last two or three years. I, I, and I remember looking at the message, and I remember the next week that he died. And I was like, wow. But that does not surprise me because when I was watching this message, I was vexed. My spirit was vexed. I was like, look at all these people. I was like, he, you know better than that. Like, you know better than that. And I'm like, you don't have to tell people that. Why would you stand up and tell people not to preach the cross? Not to talk about the blood. <laughs> now, come on now. The blood that will never lose its power. The blood that saved our lives. You're going to tell people don't talk about the blood. Go ahead, Mr. Gwen. something like this, you got to think about how merciful God has been to us. Not saying that we've said, I'm God, listen to me, but how many times have I taken glory away from God? Like God did, I was thinking today just about all of the things that God does and he should get the glory for. Family relationships that are, that are strong. Why would we give ourselves credit for that? The enemy trying to tear the family apart so if the family is tight, that is God. He's allowed it to be tight. He's allowed something to happen where it's together, even when there's all them different. He's allowed it to, it's, it's got to be God, because the enemy's trying to destroy everything. He's tearing up everything. But we'll, we'll, we'll think it's just us. But it's not just us. It's him. So, so if we're not careful, we, we take glory away from God. But in this case, and think about it, the Herod that already killed James, I guess it's like he already had it coming, <laughs> right? You didn't, you didn't touch God's anointed, if you will, right? And now you're going to stand before the people and not give glory to God. And God says, nope, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Kenny. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it means that um, like inside. He had worms on the inside. Just like today, if you have an animal that has worms, he had, he had worms, could be maggots, could be any kind of anything, any larvae, uh, but he had them on the inside, and they ate, they, ate, they ate his intestines. So, like, historically, it talks about he had this, this condition in his intestines, in his stomach. And it's like they, they, ate, they ate him from the inside out. Oh, I mean, that's how history, historian wants to tell you because when they open him up, that's what they see. But God killed him. No, no, it's not spiritual. It's just like it's what it says here. It says, um, immediately the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. Yeah, but Josephus is saying that he had him on the inside. I think, I think after that, I think it took him five days. I think historically it says he died five days later. Like he fell then and died five days later. So he, he fell, they took him wherever they take him, infirmary, whatever, and he dies and worms have eaten him. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's stories like this, though, I, I agree with Ms. Gwynn, that that should give, people should, should have some kind of reverence, reverence for God because he can do anything. It, I think people today are just more flippant, more disrespectful because they really believe there is no God. And he's not there. And I had a guy 
stand before me and say, I can stand right now and tell you something like, like the God, something, something, something. It wasn't so negative, but it was, I was just like, man, let me move out of the way before you get struck by lightning, right? And he's just looking at me and said, no, man, I'm telling you, if God, if I'm not telling the truth, may God strike me. I said, man, you, you got to be careful. Like, I, like, I just got to get out the way so he don't hit you and me at the same time. So I step back. But people just, they just do that, and, they think, and I agree with the mercy and the ignorance that people have. And God is just merciful, giving us another chance. And a lot of people are looking at that like they take his kindness for weakness. They take his grace for weakness. But then when it happens, we say, oh, wow, that was rough. Like when he just, <laughs> we like, oh, man, God, really? It's like, yeah. Yeah, 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 that, you can't do that. And then look at what it says in verse 24, though. Look at what happened. Um, Rosie did read it. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Interestingly, after that tragedy, the word of God grew. Oh, yeah. Well, we know why it grew, right? Yeah. Yeah. You killed James, and now you're out here speaking like a god, and God smites him. It's like, okay, you know what? God's, God's real. God's serious. Let's get into the word. You know, that's, that's how it is once God does something. And I think the same thing happens in our lives, too. You can be, something can be happening, and then God does, he moves. And then we do the same thing. We say, man, God is real. Let me get back in here. Let me, let me get back in. God is real. God is doing it. But it looks like what happens when, when, when Yahweh, when this guy says I'm Yahweh, nothing happens. Then it seems like our heart begins to say, well, God, we begin to doubt. But then when God shows himself strong, we go back and the word, God, word of God grows and multiplies because we're right back in the word. But we have to know that God is God, and as Gwen said, you've got to trust the fact that God is merciful. The Bible says in Peter, it says, God is not slack concerning his promise as we regard that slackness or, or um, that waiting a long time. But God is long-suffering, not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's our God. That's what he's doing. But he's still God. He's still God. There have been different movements in our lifetime where God had to deal with a leader. But like you say, we don't call it that. Like Miles Monroe, a lot of us might not want to say, well, God did that, but I believe God did that. If you go back and listen to his messages and look at what he was saying, he clearly was off. And at one point, I think he was not off. At one point, I think he was, yeah, it was solid. But then what happens? I think some of the things that happens is people lie. I read an article recently about pastors who um, don't, don't really practice what they preach. Like they're telling you what to do. Count it all joy. Give till it hurts. Whatever that thing is. But then they're not doing it. They're not counting it all joy. They're not giving till it hurts. They're not saying get over the fact that your wife left you. You know what I mean? They, they, it's easy to stand up there and just proclaim it, but when it's happening to them, they're drinking, popping pills. and <laughs> You know what I mean? But, but the people are looking at them like, oh, man, yeah, that's what I got to do, but then they're not doing it. And then when they, when they come out that they're a fraud, what do you think that does to the people? Figure it out. But I, I agree with you. I agree with what you're saying. I agree with what you're saying. I, um, I, I tell Sharif and Damien and all the people that I share with when they, when they, when they are how to preach or teach the word, I, I tell them I only preach and teach what, I can, what comes from my heart. I don't use notes. The reason I don't is because you can read some stuff and people say, wow, that's amazing. But I might not remember it tomorrow. 
But if it's coming from my heart, then it's in there. It's in there, it's in here, it's memorized. And it's not like I go and memorize it, but I memorize the word of God, and I let the spirit of God speak, and it's coming from my heart. And that's what I tell them, let it come from your heart. And it's difficult to do, you can ask them. Like when you start out, it's hard to do. Like you don't have no notes there, yeah, because I'm saying the Holy Spirit said he'll tell us what to say. Right? I mean, because you can write down some awesome stuff. But a lot of times, that ain't in your heart. And I'm not speaking for everybody. You see somebody with notes, don't think that's true. Some people write it down and it's in their heart. That's okay. But, but I've just, God just taught me to do it a different way. Because I only want to, if, if it's dates and I can't remember them, then I, don't, I feel like I don't need to know them. If it's people and I can't remember, I, you know what I'm saying? Is it Herod Agrippa? Is it Herod Antipas? Is it Herod the Great? Is it Herod, Herod Agrippa II? You know, some of those things I know because I study all the time. But then some things I don't. But what I do is I study it and try to put it in my heart so that I can share it with anybody. And you won't meet somebody in the street and say, hey, man, what's that verse about that again? And I say, oh, I got to get my notes. And then you got time to get your notes. <laughs> then, like, they want to know the answers. And so you spend that time in the Word. You really spend that time in the Word. It takes longer. And it's a lot, it's a lot more tedious. But when you stand up, you share the scripture, because if you, can't, if you don't have nothing else to say, I tell them this, you don't have nothing else to say, just read. Just read it. Read it out loud. Read it well. Read it out loud. It'll do what God sent it to do. Somebody had, somebody raised their hand just now. Oh, go ahead. So, I mean, I, I don't push on the pulpit, but I mean, I think that the word of God, sometimes God says something to my heart, and, you know, at that moment, I feel like I have some, I, I have to write them. Yeah, that's, that's okay. I'm sorry, that's not what I mean. I don't mean that. I mean when I stand up to teach. Or preach. Because when I teach, I might. Because sometimes you got stats. Honestly, I don't care about it. I told God that this morning, right? I, I just, I love God. But we, I was studying, and I, it's like all these facts. And I'm like, God, I don't care about none of that. But the people might. They might need that information. But I, don't, I don't care who blast this is. I don't care. But you might care. So I can tell you who he is. But I told the Lord, I don't care who he is. I mean, it's the word of God. It's like it tells us he was a friend of Herod. So, but you might be sitting there saying, who was blasted? So I, I need to tell you who he is. You understand what I'm saying? Some people love that detail. I'm not one of them detail type guys. Just give me the bottom. I'm a bottom line type guy. Give me the bottom line. What's the bottom line? Herod died. I'm like, that's what I care about. Like, what is, like, this guy died. What did he do? He did not give glory to God. But I do all the work that I might be able to teach you. But I'm just, being, I'm just being honest. You know, a lot of people want to do all the background and all that, and that's great. I'm not saying don't do it. But I'm saying sometimes they come back 10 years later, and that background was wrong. Like when it's not in the Bible, and somebody will tell you something about a background, and then 10 years later they say, oh, we got this culture wrong. So really, this is what they do. So now all that, that, that profound preaching on how they did something, now it changes. Because they figure out, they find some artifact or there's some Jewish scholar, and they say, no, this is not how that worked at all. This is how it worked. But you already got, and I'm saying, well, all I do is stick it right in here. Because you can't tell me, I'm just reading it right here. Right? It said he was the king's aide. Josephus is saying he was a treasurer. I wasn't there. You see what I'm saying? I wasn't there, so I don't know. I just know what the Bible says. They say he was the king's aide. So that's what, I'll, that's what I'll stick with. But I'll give you that other information because if you go and do the background yourself, you're going to read some of this information. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, like, uh, 21 says, and upon a set date, mm -hmm. what does that say? Like, a set time? Uh -huh. so, uh, just a certain day. A certain a day, day. Yeah, just a certain day. So uh -huh. a certain day. And I think when it says set day, that means a day and time that historically people can go back and research it, and you can you can't, because Josephus speaks about that day. Jo Josephus was a Jewish historian. So you can, I mean, it's just he's not religious. He's not a follower of Christ. He's just a Jewish historian. And you can read his history, Jewish history, and you, you hear about Jesus, and you hear about Herod. You hear about different things that happened in their history, which confirms the Bible. Okay. All right, so, we, so the, the point here, I think, is we don't ever want to not give God glory. 
We always want to give glory to God for your marriage, for your health, for your strength, for your talents, for your abilities, for whatever it is, good and bad. Because he can make all things work together for good, even the bad. And we got to think about that. You got to think about that. I mean, I am where I am today as a human being because more because of the negative things that happened to me. More because of the poor decisions I made. I learned more from my bad decisions than my good ones. Yeah, I learned more what not to do from the bad decisions and the consequences. So I thank God for the consequences. I thank God for those people telling me don't do that and I did it anyway because I, now I thank God for those voices because they were trying to help me. They loved me, right, when I wasn't trying to be loved. Now I know how much they loved me, your grandmother, your grandfather, your aunts, your uncles, pastors, people that God put in your life that were trying to tell you which way to go. My, I remember my, remember my mom wanted me to go to Liberty. She said, go to Liberty. At that point in time, pastors' children went for free. And I would have got a scholarship anyway. But um, I was like, I do not want to go to Liberty. I just don't. I didn't apply to Liberty. <laughs> I wasn't going to Liberty. But then I remember when I was in seminary, I was like, I should have went to Liberty. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I should have went to Liberty. I could have had this gone done a long time ago. I wouldn't have paid for it. Right? But now I had to pay for it. But So I got the same education, but I paid for it now. It's like, but if you'd listen. So I'm like, I thank God for my mom. Then when she speaks, I listen. She said, I said yes, ma'am. <laughs> oh, and the word of God still grows and multiplies. Then the last verse in this chapter says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Surname or other name, alias name, was Mark, and then we're going to go right into chapter 13 because I want to, yep, I want to go right into 13 and talk about fasting and seeking the Lord. Verse number one of chapter 13 says, now in the church that was at Antioch, remember this church that formed in Antioch in Acts chapter 11, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So I know what you want to know, like, who are these people, right? <laughs> like, who are all these people, right? So we know Barnabas, right? Barnabas was a Levite. They mean son of encouragement. Simeon, is, is, it does sound familiar, but it's not a person we know. It says he was called Niger. Niger uh, could mean that he was African. All right, the word Niger does mean the, the color black. Um, so he could, he could have been African. It's very possible. Could have been from the country of Niger, which still would have made him African. <laughs> um, which is awesome because, thank you, Damien. Uh, which is awesome because, you know, the people that say, the Bible is a white man's book and this, that, and the other. Well, it's got people sprinkled in it that look like us. We talked about the Ethiopian eunuch already in Acts chapter 8. Now here's, here's Simeon of Niger. He is well known. He is spiritual. And that's when people say stuff like that. It, you know, it's like, well, your people in there too. And, and then the other thing about it is the, most of the white people don't follow their book. Right? So I, mean, so, I mean, what good is that? Like, what's the, what's the point? Some do and some don't. Just like us, some do and some don't. Like, it ain't like every black person follows the Bible. Come on, man. That ain't true. Go ahead, Leroy. No, no. That is not, that is not the Simeon that came across. You say, how you know? Just because of the way it, it describes him here. And the other Simeon, uh, um, uh, yes. 
Let's look. Let's see what it says. All right, so my name is Looking for the gospel recording of where he is. Simon. Simon. Luke. Which is the same, doing the same word, but Luke. Um, I'm in Luke 23, 26. Now, as they led him away, they, they laid hold of a certain man, um, Simon, which, which is the same word, really. Uh, Cyrenian, Cyrenian, uh -huh. who is coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross, and he might bear it after Jesus. Yeah. Another, one, another thing, when he introduces these people, he says certain prophets and teachers... Uh, and then you got Lucius, and that's not Luke. That's not the Luke, you know, that writes the, the, the book of Acts. It's not the same person. Manan, this, this guy's interesting. It gives us some inf information about him. Where was he brought up? Yeah, he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So Herod the Tetrarch, Tetrarch means the rule of four regions. So this, that Herod... The Herod, Herod the Tetra is the Herod after the death of um, his dad. So this is that Herod. Herod the Tetra is the Herod of the gospel, not the Herod of the birth of Jesus, not Herod the Great. Right? But this is, this is um, Herod Antipas. But Herod Antipas and Manan was brought up in the same household. So they were brought up with Herod the Great. That's all, that's important. Because he's growing up, now Herod wanted all the children, Herod the Great wanted all the children killed when Jesus was born. So he's growing up in this same area, and then this other Herod, Herod Antipas, the same Herod that wanted, that ended up having John the Baptist's head cut off, him and Manan grew up together. So you got to understand, these people grew up, they know what's going on. He knows John the Baptist. He knows Jesus. He knows the ministry of Jesus. And now this, per this person is considered a prophet or a teacher. God is awesome. These are people that grew up in Herod's household. So that's why he gives us this specific information, because it's like, and this person grew up around royalty, if you will. And then it says, and Saul, and we know who he is. So all these guys are hanging out together. Verse number two says, as they ministered to the Lord. What does that mean? Okay, they were praying daily, all right. Okay, they were praying daily. Thank you, Miss Joyce. Anybody else? How do you minister to the Lord? Yeah, that way. Encouraging the Lord. They were encouraging the Lord by doing what? I mean, I don't know. God. When I'm thinking to because God. he's Jesus. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, like, how can anyone minister to him? Maybe encouraging him, actually praying with him. Yeah. I mean, with him. Jesus. Yeah. Oh wait, okay. Yeah, but it's okay. I like I like where you started going. The only thing I, I would say is they were encouraging him by telling him the law, but I would say by praying and by studying, it was encouraging to the Lord by their obedience. I mean, you think about you think about this this point right here, Damon. If you could put your little hand over as they minister to the Lord. I mean, think about it, think about it. we always talk about ministry. Right? And ministry to ministers to meet a need. It says, as they ministered to the Lord. I think we would say it this way probably, as they worshiped. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
up praising him. Yeah, Joyce. I'm saying that you bring it back to God, what he gave to us. Okay, okay. That's ministering back to him. Okay. We will minister to our person. Okay. Minister to God. Okay, Ellen. I think that's why I was struggling to articulate what I thought it was because I'm, I was trying to just, I was trying to break away from how we typically associate what ministering is and I'm like how do you minister to the Lord right. it's different from how we use the term when we interact with each other and say I was ministering to someone usually right. we mean sharing the word or you know doing something for that person but I, was, I know he's doing something for God, but okay. not in the context of how we do it when we interact with each other. Right. I like what you just said. You said doing something for the Lord. Doing something for the Lord as opposed to as opposed to doing something for yourself. Interesting here, the word that's used is the word that we get the English word liturgy from. The word that's used to say they were ministering to the Lord is the word that we get the word liturgy from. Liturgy is a set of writings or readings that, that they say. That's what liturgy is. Go ahead, um, Lethe. <laughs> Go ahead, Lethe. Oh, this is. I think you can, but that's not what they were doing here. Yeah. But I think you can. Yeah. yeah, I think you can. I think I think anything we do yes. for the Lord mm -hmm. and not for us provides ministry to the Lord. Yeah, Lethe, go ahead. I think that's kind of what I was going to. I was going to ask, is ministering to the Lord? Could it have been not just Water, you need, you know, shade or whatever, like they would just help provide for him what he might have needed physically, like go get me this or go do that. The Lord here is Jesus. Oh, I know. God. Okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, but I guess what I'm saying, like, yeah, I'm yeah. Trying to think, could it have been ministering to, like, his needs, whatever. I mean, I know he's God, but he's mm -hmm. also flesh, so I'm wondering if, you know, like, anointing him with oil or whatever, I mean, whatever he might right. have needed them to do, like, go get me food or... Right. Well, you know, but we all, just be clear, yeah. he's not physically there, but... Oh. He's not physically there. Okay, yeah, 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 he's not, yeah, he's not physically there. It, it, it's, I'm just saying the statement is... <laughs> And they minister to the Lord. But, but what I, what I want to bring out is what we were just saying, though, is when we come, for example, here, and we come here for the Lord, then you're ministering to the Lord. But when we come here for us, that is different. Yeah, yeah everybody understand what I'm saying? I'm like, when you get up and you say, man, I need a word. Now, I'm not saying don't come because you need a word. Come, come because you need a word. But I'm saying that's different when you get up and say, I am going to worship the Lord. I might need a word. He might give me a word. But my purpose is to go and worship him. And that's what I've been trying to say for a long time. It's like we, we should be coming to the house for him, not for us first. And then when you come to, to, the, to the house for him first, then you're going to hear the Holy Spirit speak and tell us what to do. Yeah, Lethe. Okay, so here's what, okay, I, hear, I think I hear what you're saying. Okay, so I hear you saying that you're ministering to God for the Lord. Yes. But then when you come to the house for the Lord, so is that the same? Is that saying that I'm not coming to worship the Lord? I mean, I'm not coming for any particular thing, but I want to hear what He has to say to me. But like sure. what you're saying, you, the Holy Spirit. Oh, say that last part again. I'm coming to hear what uh, He, you God, are, you God, are coming to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming to hear what God yeah. Has see, to say see, and that's the thing. I think prayer okay. is one of those things that works both ways every time. 
Because I think when you pray, you're praying to him, and he wants us to pray. And we're listening for him. I think, you, I think and that's kind of what's happening here. Obviously, it's what's happening. Let me go to the next one. It says, it says and they minister to the Lord, right? All of us need to minister to the Lord. We need to worship God. We need to do something for him, not just for us. It says, and fasted. So now, now think about how they, they came, and fasting is when you turn down the plate and or water. Most of the time in the Bible, it's food and water. You turn that down to seek God spiritually. All right? All right? You're not commanded to fast, but fasting is something you can individually do on your own to seek God. It's a good thing to do. If you've never done it, I would advise people to do it if you've never fasted. But if you've had periods of fasting in your life, then I understand that. There's not a New Testament command that says you must fast. But this is what they were doing. They obviously were praying. They had fasted. And then in the midst of that, the Holy Spirit said. See, so while they were in that way, the Holy Spirit spoke in a way in which it's, it's not just one person receiving the revelation. Now, you already got prophets and teachers there, so you got serious spiritual seekers there. But when they came together to minister to the Lord, it had to be thanksgiving and worship, and it, it was all vertical. It was all up to the Lord. Then, and they were fasting, so it wasn't about them. They, they, had, they were fasting, so it ain't about us, God. It's about you and what you want. You know, it, it, so to me, it wasn't even like, Lord, what we want. It's like, Lord, we want direction. That's what it seemed like they were seeking the Lord for, just direction. Lord, I need direction. Just tell me where to go. You know, you don't get the next request where somebody has cancer, they were healed, somebody's dying. You don't get all of that. You get separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. You get the Lord just comes in and speaks. And says, separate these two people, I have a work for them. That's what happened when they were ministering to the Lord, fasting, seeking the Lord. Separate them for the work I have called them. Verse 3 says, then having fasted and prayed. Saul, uh, Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul. As it ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they laid their hands on them, they sent them away. They did exactly what the Lord said. They didn't say, well, not, not Paul, not, I mean, not, I keep calling Paul, not Saul, not Barnabas. We need them, Lord. No, it was like, Lord, that's what he said. Let's pray for them. <laughs> Let's ordain them. That's what ordination is, confer, a conferring of rights, authority, and um, a mission. That's what an ordination is. They ordained them. They just laid their hands on them and said, all right, we're sending you guys out in the name of the Lord from this church in Antioch. Saul is still Saul at this point. That's about to change. That's about to change. But, and that's interesting in itself. So, um, all right, so everybody, I probably should stop right here, though. You know what? I probably should stop just so we can let all this sink in. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop at verse 4. It says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. So you're talking to people about planting churches, um, missionary work, all of that. People shouldn't send people. The Holy Spirit should send people. And see, this is where we get ahead of God. This is where we run is when we say that, okay, we should be doing missions. Then everybody wants to send somebody to some remote part of the world. But what if that's not God's will? What if that's us saying, this is what God wants, so let's do it, versus us fasting and praying and coming together, and all of us say that God is saying, send Everett to Israel. Right? Other than that, it should be a burden from the Lord for us. But what happens is, as humans, 
when God gives us any part of the plan, we say, I got the rest of it, God. I got it. We got it. You want us to make disciples? I got it. We'll send people around the world. We'll give them to God. And then we get upset when the natives kill people. Like, I can't, I can't say that every missionary that left and went was sent by God. But the ones that are, their ministry is fruitful. Now, I don't mean by thousands of converts, but I mean they're still there, they're with the people, and they're sharing Christ. I think, so we got a lot to think about because what we want to do is, is just, just, just manufacture spirituality. That, that's why, you know, that's why I always didn't like the word, um, what's the word? It starts with an M. Um, you all know the word. It's just, no one's ever, to make you do something. Mandatory. That, man, I hate that word when you're talking to Christians. And is this mandatory? I'm like, is you a Christian? Is it mandatory to come and pray? Is it mandatory? Like, I hate, I don't, I don't like that. But now I have made it mandatory for leaders. I have. Not for just people, that, lay people, but for leaders. If you're a leader, it's mandatory. If I have to tell you that. Until, you're, until everything catch up and you get it. That you should want to pray. This doesn't appear to be mandatory. That's why I like they minister to the Lord. It's, it's almost like the heart of David. When David comes and says, Lord... I want to build you a house. You know, that's why when you guys were talking about you want to do something for the Lord, even physically, I'm like, well, that's, that was David's mindset. David said, Lord, I'm going to build your house. And God's like, David, come on, man. You don't have a house big enough for me to live in. Are like, you know how big I am? <laughs> like, the earth is my footstool. I rest my feet on the earth. What are you going to build? But God saw his heart that he wanted to do something for God. And we just came off the 4th of July, and everybody likes to quote, do not ask what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And then we spiritualized it and said, do not ask what God can do for you, but ask what you can do for your God. And I say it, and I say it again, that's true. Stop asking what God can do for you. He's done a lot, enough, I want to say. But he's not done. That's why I say I want to say, because he's still doing stuff. But we should be asking constantly, God, what can I do for you? We should be. Just because we go back and think about, we count our many blessings. You try to name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. I mean, if you actually do that, and I, I've tried to do it a few times. I try to do it almost every day. But I just think about the blessings of the day. And I'm like, man, God, you are amazing. When I think about the black, yesterday went to Kings Dominion, it poured down raining. It was a blessing. I didn't want to ride nothing. And we couldn't. They shut the whole park down. We got, <laughs> I didn't pray for that. But I'm like, man, I'm old and I'm big. You can't, man, them rides, man. When I, today, I'd be barely able to walk. I'm old enough now. My knees would be hurting. My back would be all shifted. You know, but we had a blast in the park. And I'm going, I'm like, God, you are so good. You are so good. I should, I, that's exactly how I felt. I know a whole bunch of other people was upset. And then you know what they said? We was going out of the park. Keep your ticket. You can come back any day between now and September the 2nd. And I'm like, look at you, Lord. It's a double blessing. <laughs> I mean, but I, and I thank God for them things. I was just like, man, that's God. I just give him glory. And to me, people, man, God cares about your little thing. He does. Don't you think he does? And yes, he got a big job to do with holding the universe together, but he cares about your little thing. I am living proof that he cares about the thing that we think. Sometimes we ain't even concerned about it as much as we ought to be. And he cares about it. That's our God. So I think today, you know, as you leave here today, think about two things for sure. Think about Herod and how he died. Let's not take glory away from God. When you look back over your life, 
Man, God deserves glory. Has everything been peaches and cream? Probably not. But look at what he's done. Look at the future ahead. That's one thing. So don't take glory away from him. The second thing is, every time when you get ready to come to this place, come to minister to the Lord. Come to minister to the Lord. And I, I guarantee you, for me and all of us, that slight thought will enhance your encounter. That little thought that, Lord, I'm coming here not to preach. I'm coming here to minister to you. And what do you need? Nothing. <laughs> you don't need anything. So ministering to him says, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm obedient. I'm, I love you, Lord. Let me, let me shower you with adoration and praise the way you showered me with life, eternal life, family church family, blessing. The way you bless me, let me shower you with the way I live, with the words that I say, with even me controlling my thought life. I control that life in my mind because I love you. I won't let it run crazy because I love you. So I'm going to stop it right there. Minister to the Lord. All right? Yes, Miss Hill. Blackaby says, and I always say, Lord, what can I join you in? Yes. In doing for you? Yes. Amen. The spirits of God, yes, and they're blackaby, yep. Yeah, I can enjoy you way you're at work. Yeah. And that's that so true. And God is at work here. He's at work in you. He that begun a good work will perform it, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Yeah, kidding. Yeah. Doesn't matter where you are. Yes, you're right. Yeah, you're a minister to the Lord. Yeah, in your prayer closet, in your kitchen table. Yes, yes, yes. When I say come here, I, I think often, and there's nothing wrong with coming because we need a word, but I think if we could switch that to I've come to minister to you, even though I need a word. You know, I just think corporately. Whatever we're doing individually, we ought to want to do corporately. Right? So if we're doing it at home, we want to come together and do it because all of us are doing it and we all got insight that God's sharing with us, and we got things going on that we want to share because it'll bless somebody else around you. That's the assumption that we all are doing it. <laughs> uh, Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you so much for your word today. We thank you for the fact that you are a jealous God. And um, Lord, even in this context here, you revealed and showed that when, when, when someone would just take glory away from you and not let people know something different, but let their ego grow through what the people are saying, uh, Lord, that you clearly declare that there is no other God but you. And when Jesus walked the earth, Lord, the many, many things Jesus did, it is clear from this that Jesus has to be God because, Father, you would have smote him too if he would have made a claim that wasn't true. So we thank you, God, that as we continue to read through Scripture, it continues to open up our understanding that who Jesus is and who you are and your spirit that lives within us can take this word, help us to understand it, and to live by it. So God, I thank you for everybody that came here today. They could have been somewhere else, but they made it, they purposed it in their heart to be here today. And I thank you for them. I pray that they were blessed as they sit in your presence, as they look over the words of Scripture. I do pray that the people were blessed. But I pray that all of us, myself included, and beginning with me, that from this day forward, Lord, when I come, I come to minister to you. 
I come to give glory and honor to you. I come in a new way to worship you. And I pray, God, that if people are watching my example, that they would see that and they would imitate that and they would give glory and honor to you. As Kenny said, at home, on vacation, on Sunday, and all through the week, Lord, that you would be glorified. And then, Lord, as we are obedient to you, would you bless us? Would you provide? Would you let us know we're on the right track? Because we need you, Lord. We have family members that don't know you yet and need you, Lord. We want you to save our family members. We want you to work in our lives, God. I pray what Rosie prayed, Lord. And I beg you, Lord, Open up the hearts and minds of the people we love and influence that they might come to know you as Savior. We love you today, Lord. Thank you in the name of Jesus for this moment. Amen. Amen. Love you all. Thank you. Make sure you greet.